Well, I'm going to start this morning by, by telling you about one of the most horrific things I've actually think I've ever seen. Well, great way to start a sermon, huh? I was flipping around one day on the TV, and I stopped on a show that was on the National Geographic Channel. It was about a wildlife photographer in Africa who's filming lions. He'd actually set up uh, a number of cameras, including an infrared camera, where he could watch a pride of lionesses uh, in their den with their cubs. And he and therefore could do it by day and by night. It was, it was really interesting and really cool to watch. Suddenly, this wonderful show turned horrific. Uncharacteristically, all the lionesses went out hunting one night, and they left the cubs unprotected. And a large male lion walked into the den. Slowly and methodically, he went up to each curious cub, and he sniffed it. And then if he determined it was a male, he took it in its, its head in its vast jaws, bit down and shook, breaking its neck, and then casually dropping it to the ground. Now, I sat there, and I watched three cubs die like that, and then I had to change the channel. I, I'm still slightly haunted by the image, and, and I remember being so incredibly angry at that evil lion for what he had done. And you know what, though? The more I thought about it, the more I realized, well, the lion wasn't really evil. He was simply acting on biological instinct and urges. Eliminate challengers to his position before they could grow up and challenge him. Pure survival of the fittest. Biology and natural selection has no morals. Lions have no rules against murder. But we do. It's the Sixth Commandment. Let me start this morning with a side note. When, when you're talking about faith with someone who doesn't believe in God, or that there is any meaning or intention in life, and that our existence is all just some grand, random, evolutionary created happenstance, ask him or her then why we should not kill what it is in our own self-interest. Because if this world is not created by a creator who did so with meaning and purpose and intention, well then really all human laws and morals are just temporary cultural opinions. And, and killing a human being is no more of an intrinsically immoral act than swatting a fly or, or killing a rival lion cub. I think that more people know the Sixth Commandment than any other. But to be honest, most of them know it incorrectly. Almost anyone can quote the commandment in the old King James language, thou shall not kill. But that translation is imprecise enough to be deceptive. Almost every modern translation of the Bible now translates Exodus 20, 13 as you shall not murder. And I think you can see how this changes uh, the meaning uh, instantly. There are eight words in Hebrew for killing with various meanings and uses. The word used here is a very specific word. It's rasha or rashesh. It's generally used when a killing is unjustified. And that ranges from flat-out murder to, to negligent manslaughter. In general, it refers to an unlawful or an unjustified killing of another human. I think a good way to put it, maybe as a paraphrase, is you shall not take innocent life. I have to say I'm surprised at how many people don't know this who should. Years ago, when I was a guest on a Dennis Prager radio show, I had to explain this to a Jewish rabbi who didn't believe me. So Dennis had to chime in on my side. Um, I had to say it's the only time in my life I ever got to correct a rabbi's Hebrew. Uh, or that I got an opinion in before Dennis had his say. He was... Time and time again, you will hear people quote this commandment in support of ideas or positions that it was probably never meant to cover. It's often the main proof text for those who oppose the death penalty or war. You've got to remember, friends, the Old Testament has plenty of laws that call for the death penalty, justly administered by community rulers. Even in the New Testament, Paul mentions that earthly rulers justly bear the sword by God's design for public order. 
And while war is usually a manifestation of human sin, it is at times instituted by God for his purpose, and sometimes is the best course of action in a fallen and imperfect world where there are no perfect actions. Augustine and Calvin have written about just war. Honestly, I found Philip Ryken's short summary uh, about this perhaps the best I've ever read. He writes, The Bible teaches that it is not unlawful to kill enemies in wartime, provided the war is just. Christians have long believed that a war is just only if it is waged by a legitimate government for a worthy cause, with force proportional to the attack against soldiers, not civilians, when all other means of resolution have failed. So why this, while this is the, the best known commandment, it may also be the most misunderstood and misused. One interesting Bible nerd note for you. How many of you have heard or know the answer to the Bible tri trivia question, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Normally the given answer is John 11.35, Jesus wept. Actually, in the original text, Exodus 20.13 uh, is much shorter. You see, all of the commandments except the very first commandment, the you shall part, is not actually in the Hebrew text. It's simply assumed. And it's used in most translations to give the, each commandment kind of a standalone quality. So Exodus 20.13 is simply two Hebrew words. The short word for the negative, lo, and, and the word for it, I'm just kidding, rasha. Um, and remember, Hebrew has no written vowels. So it's actually only six letters. While Jesus wept has 16. So it's the clear winner. I have to say, I think this also proves that originally God used PowerPoint to present the commandments with bullet points. <laughs> it's, it's just my interpretation. But. Now, I don't honestly think there's a person I have ever met who would completely disagree with this commandment. Equally, I, I, I don't think there's a person in this congregation who is suddenly this morning under great conviction as we talk about murder. But you should be. Because this commandment isn't just about committing murder. It's about what is sometimes called hidden murder that's in all of our hearts. You know, Jesus had a powerful way of unmasking our hidden sin and self-righteousness. Matthew recorded this time and time again, especially in his uh, collection of Jesus' teachings we call the Sermon on the Mount. Let me read from the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus deals with the Sixth Commandment. It's Matthew Chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. Jesus said, You have heard it said, said of those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And then the Apostle John expands on this when he says in 1 John, if anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Well, dang. Put a few quotes this morning in your outline from the Heidelberg Catechism. Because they reflect a pretty standard Reformed understanding of how Jesus takes this commandment and then applies it to our own inner thoughts and motives. You can look at them if you want. 105, what is God's commandment for you in the sixth commandment? It doesn't start by saying don't kill. It says, I am not to belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look or gesture, and certainly not by my actual deeds. And I will not be a party of this and others. Rather, I am to put away all desire for revenge. I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself either. Prevention of murder is also why governments, the government is armed with the sword. Well, then it follows up, question 106. Does this commandment refer only to murder? By forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, and vindictiveness. In God's sight, all such things are, Then the old translation was, hidden forms of murder. And then no one will seven, if he didn't get the rest of it. Is it enough that we do not murder our neighbor in any such way? 
No, by condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, friendly towards them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and do to do good, even to our enemies. And while I don't know that I expect you to remember all of this, I hope that at the very least you would consider memorizing answer uh, question 12 and our New City Catechism. You know, what does God com- require in the Sixth Commandment? That we do not hurt or hate or be hostile to our neighbor, but be patient and peaceful, pursuing even our enemies with love. Okay, the bar just got way higher, didn't it? So let me suggest to you that if you thought you were safe this morning from today's commandment, think again. I will tell you that I am certainly not, and I see these faults in myself all too often. This last week, I was inwardly thrilled to hear that the ISIS leader who had captured, abused, and raped American aid worker Kayla Mueller had blown himself up in his rat hole as U.S. troops and dogs closed in. And mind you, this action by our government, you know, legitimate government authorities, was well justified and biblically sound. But I have inwardly wished this man a harsh and painful death for years for what he did. And I have to be honest and accept that for me, that wish was a violation of the Sixth Commandment. God even said in Ezekiel, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Sovereign Lord. The answer is no. Rather, I am not pleased. Am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? So this morning, I want us all to realize there is more to this commandment than the face value. Jesus drives home the deeper meaning of why God commands this. And he exposes the hidden murder that we all harbor in our own hearts. Christ pushes us to open our hearts that are so easily closed. In fact, I love how Michael Horton summarizes this and puts it all in context. He said, if we are really going to love our neighbor, which is the intention of the Sixth Commandment, we are going to have to love our enemies and the enemies of the gospel. We're going to have to demonstrate that love in tangible ways, not only to brothers and sisters in the faith, but to aliens and strangers outside the kingdom even those who would just as soon see the church buried, for this is the true test. After all, asked Jesus, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? And he sums it up by saying, in other words, every group looks out for its own kind. Each minority group looks after its special interest. And I especially love this line. It says, Our society is becoming increasingly dominated by special interest groups, each vying for its own piece of the pie, often to the extent that people forget their duty to the whole of society. Jesus confronts us here as Christians and says, in effect, isn't that the sort of love the pagans have? The kingdom of God commands an attitude that is much more selfless and far less bigoted than that. And it's all rooted in the Sixth Commandment. Now, in the time I have left, and I know I don't have a lot, I just want to mention two topics that I believe um, really should be directly influenced by the Sixth Commandment. There are a bunch I could talk about. I have put down in the outline some questions for small groups to talk about more of them. Each of these two things I'm going to talk about is a sermon in itself, or two or three sermons in itself. So my, my... Brief comments are going to be woefully inadequate. But, you know, I hope that what happens every Sunday morning is that I spark in you a desire for further biblically-based reflection and inquiry rather than assuming I'm simply going to give you everything God wants you to know or believe about something. First thing I want to talk about these two about this morning is euthanasia and assisted suicide. You know, the age we live in carries with it both wonders and dangers. We, we do wonderful things with medicine. But that means we also have the ability to keep people alive long after their bodies would normally give way to illness and infirmity. It creates a lot of problems for family and for health care and sometimes for the economy. And for many, it seems the obvious answer is to help or encourage people to die 
when we deem the time, when we deem the time is right. I think the Six Commandments makes it clear that we have to be very careful about how we approach this and, and really err on the side of preservation of innocent life. If someone is critically ill with no hope of full recovery and chooses to end their medical treatments, I know of no sound theological mind that's opposed to that. But it is a short and easy step from this to go to a society that encourages the elderly, the infirm, the imperfect to end their lives so as not to be a burden for others. Nowhere has this become more common than in the Netherlands, where assisted suicide and euthanasia is not only becoming common, but it's increasingly done without the full consent of all of those killed. And even back in 1997, almost over 20 years ago, The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, reported that 8% of the infants who die in the Netherlands were put to sleep by their doctors. I love that euphemism, put to sleep. One astute commentator noticed how quickly this change has taken hold. He said it was not always so. Hitler issued the first direct order for euthanasia, October 1st, 1939. Those orders spread to all Nazi-occupied countries. Ten years later, in 1949, the New England Medical Journal article reported that during World War II, Dutch doctors, unlike the doctors in every other Nazi-occupied country, did not participate in even one act of euthanasia. Nuremberg condemned euthanasia as a war crime. Yet the view of, doc, Jewish, uh, the view of Dutch doctors has changed. As Malcolm Muggeridge, the British journalist, observed, it took no more than three decades to transfer a war crime into an act of compassion. Increasingly, people with personal struggles or mental illness have been asked to be put to death. On January 26, 2017, Aurelia Bowers lay down on her bed to die, clutching a pink toy dinosaur, listening to her favorite music. The 29-year-old drank her prescribed medications as close friends gathered around. She had no physical illness, but struggled with depression and severe anxiety and eating disorders. Last year, -year 17-year-old Noah Potoven, who struggled with depression and PTSD after a sexual assault, petitioned for euthanasia. This is becoming an accepted way to deal with even non-medical problems. And I think we need to be very careful here. The Sixth Commandment calls us to protect the most vulnerable, sometimes even from themselves. This is why Christians have always supposed suicide. And why we cannot allow a society to say that it's okay to kill yourself when things are hard or when you think you're a burden to others. Well, the final thing I want to touch just briefly on is probably the hottest button issue of them all, and that's abortion. Of course, I can't cover much here, but it's hard to leave this commandment without saying something. It amazes me that someone can somehow come to the conclusion that a fetus growing inside their mother's body is not a human being. Of course it is. It is a human being in a unique state where it is being nourished and protected and grows inside its mother. But it is human and alive and about as innocent as a human being can be. It does not cease to be a human simply if someone doesn't want it. The Sixth Commandment tells us not to kill innocent life. And it's not logically possible to disconnect this command from abortion that is done simply for convenience. And it is fair to say that the health of the mother is just as big a concern. And just like all of life's imperatives, sometimes we do have to balance two equal rights uh, and concerns and come, that come into conflict. And I do recognize that these are not always easy decisions to resolve, and sometimes the resulting decisions are less than clear or perfect. But as the development of a child in the womb continues in a healthy woman, it's not long before a child in utero has all the characteristics that we associate with human life. Working organs, beating hearts, brain waves, independent movement, and more. I do believe that the Sixth Commandment instructs us to protect this kind of life, even when it is difficult or personally costly to do so. If we are to love our enemies, how are we not also to love the children who grow within us? You know, a lot of people think this is a new issue, 
but abortion was common in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. And one of some of the earliest Christian documents we have, one that almost made it into the New Testament, clearly condemns it, the Didache. And let me tell you, friends, I cannot touch on this subject without saying this loud and clear. This would not be the issue that it is if men, men, would be more responsible with their sexuality and 100% supportive in every way possible of the children they co-create. Too many women feel that they have to get an abortion because of pressure from the sperm donor or abandonment by them. This is not simply a women's issue. And men need to be very careful that they don't place the burden of abortion or childbirth or parenting solely on the backs of women, many of whom are very vulnerable. Frankly, the, the lack of men being responsible is one of the key factors that drives abortion in America today. And, and let me just say that if you have swallowed the current Kool-Aid that says that even up to the moment a child is born full term and draws their first breath of post-uterine air, they're not really human and have no right to protection. Well then, friends, you need to remember that the very first human to recognize Jesus as the Savior was John the Baptist while he was still in Elizabeth's womb. The Sixth Commandment ought to teach us about protecting innocent children at any stage of development. All right, now that I have stirred the pot, let me leave it, end you with a final thought. You know, we've all violated the Sixth Commandment. Frankly, in one of the most dramatic ways possible. Who was the one person who lived the most innocent of all lives, but who instead of being honored, we unjustly took his life? Jesus, of course. And just like Jesus transforms all of the commandments, here not only does he transform the sixth commandment, but he also fulfills it. Again, from Philip Ryken. It's a good thing that Jesus died on the cross as he did for murderers as much as for anyone. We know this because he offered forgiveness to the very people who murdered him. After Jesus ascended into heaven, the apostle Peter preached in Jerusalem to the same people who had called for Christ to be crucified. He basically accused them of murder, of killing the one who came to be their savior. When they realized what they'd done, they desperately wanted to know what they could do about it. And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then Riken finishes with this. If you're the kind of person who breaks the sixth commandment, and we all are, then there is hope for you in the cross of Christ. Save a life, your own life, by trusting him. Pray with me. Father, in thought, if not in deed, we have hated our brother. We have not valued the lives of others. We have embraced a, a kind of hidden murder that makes us feel self-righteous. And we know how difficult and how painful that is to you. Father, indeed, let us in every way in our life protect innocent life, the innocent life that you've created. And let us be a witness to our world of how important the life that you've created is. But let us always remember that the end goal of that life was to understand that there was one life that was traded for all of theirs. And we do that by following, loving, and serving Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. You know, it's here at the table that we remember that life that was given for our life, where we come here and forget that, that what we remember here is the worst act of all history, made into the greatest act of all history by the love of God. For here we use these simple elements to remember what was done for us in Jesus Christ. For in the night in which he was retired, our Lord Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this remembering me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he poured it out. And he said, this cup is a new covenant, poured out for the remission of sins, poured out in my blood. Do this also remembering me. 
And Paul tells us that every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So join me in prayer. Father, thank you that you have brought us to this table, that it was by your death that our sins have been covered. It is by your sacrifice that we have been justified. It is by your sinless life that our sinful lives have been atoned for. And Father, we ask that you would take these very simple elements, set them aside for the wonderful, holy, and sacred purpose of reminding us of who you are and how deep and how broad and how wide your love for us is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, if I have those assisting with communion, please come forward. We'll invite you to come forward and receive communion by tearing off a piece of bread and dipping it into the cup and receiving it where you're, as you stand here, you can return to your seat by the center side aisles. For any reason at all, you wish to receive communion, but don't wish or can't, have find it hard to come forward, we'll have ushers that will bring down a tray of the side aisles. Thank you.